I'm so excited this morning to open God's Word with you. We are going to be, as listed in the bulletin, we are going to be in 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 9. We're going to be reading verses 16 to 23. So you're welcome to open your Bibles or your phones. The, the words will also be on the screens for you to follow along. But I invite you to listen to the word of the Lord. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for your word that even though the grass withers and the flowers fall, your word stands forever. We pray our hearts and minds will be open to the message you have for us this morning in your eternal word. And we thank you for it. In the name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus. Amen. When I was in college, I went on a spring break mission trip. I know what you're thinking. That sounds kind of funny, right? Spring break mission trip. Who does that? I mean, really? Who in their right mind would go on a mission trip? on spring break. Well, apparently me and a bunch of my friends, um, don't hold this against me, I was with the Baptist Student Union. They were the more active campus ministry at the time, so that's who I was with. And we went to Panama City Beach, Florida. Has anybody in here ever been to Panama, Panama City, Panama City Beach? I grew up on the west side of the state, so the Gulf was a lot closer for us to drive. You know, that's where I grew up going to the beach year after year. And I, the beach has always been my favorite place. So in March of 2000-something, I went on a spring break mission trip with some college friends from the Baptist Student Union. And if you know anything about Panama City Beach and spring break, it's definitely, at least it was then, I'm thinking it probably still is. I don't know, hadn't been there in a while, but it's a spring break hot spot. You have spring break, whether it's high school or college, you have a lot of kids that go and Let's just say they get a little wild, right, and reckless and party. Well, our job or our mission to them was one of them was providing a free shuttle service to the bars or clubs or restaurants. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of people overindulge, right, and they're under the influence. And that was just for us a loving way to provide a safe ride instead of them getting behind the wheel, right? So we provided, that was one thing we did. We, we drove um, college students and really anybody that needed a ride, you know, to, to Sharky's or Club La Vila or one of the local restaurants there in Panama City. So they're having a good time and we're trying to help them out. And um, another thing we did was we did a free pancake breakfast uh, for them. Now, if that's not love, I mean, free food, to anybody, but especially college students. That's, that's a big deal. So uh, we had free pancakes, and this was before Facebook got really big. I don't know when Facebook really started, but I was in college before, like social media was a huge thing. And so, we, you know, it's not like we're going to post about it. So we had poster boards. Anybody knows what those are uh, about free pancake breakfast. And we're out there by the side of the road, you know, telling anybody that'll come by, we have free pancakes. And one of my friends, She's a wonderful person, very smart, 
but not always aware of social surroundings or she wasn't uh, really, she's pro- I'm probably some of the same way sometimes, but she was out there with her boyfriend. They were out there advertising the pancake breakfast and she was saying, come on, it's free. You know you want some, come get some. And I had to tell her, I'm gonna call her, I'll call her Margaret. That's not her name. Margaret, you might want to say free pancakes. These are college guys. If you say, come get some, it's free. They're not going to be thinking about pancakes, but her mind didn't go there. Bless her. She didn't, she didn't go there. So we had to tell her that was just a funny thing. It's like, no, these are college guys. Pancakes. Make sure you tell them it's pancakes. Um, and so while we're, and then we're driving the buses around. And one night we went to one of the local nightclubs, the big one there, which at the time it was Spinnaker or Club La Vila. So we're outside there, and some of y'all have probably been there. Um, and there's a line of people waiting to get in. And our job was to walk up to these people who we didn't know from Adam's house, get to walk up to these people and start talking to them and tell them about Jesus and maybe give them a gospel track. That was the most nerve wracking thing I have ever done. I know I'm a preacher. But in college, that I was just like, I do not want to do this. I did not sign up for this. I don't want to walk up to those people who don't know me. I don't know them. I don't want to. They're waiting to get in the nightclub. They, they don't want to hear about Jesus. Or at least that was my thought at the time. But I did it. I forced myself. Y'all, I was so uncomfortable. I was like, hi. You want to, you know, and just passing out a tract. I don't even remember, but I was just like, I hate this. I hate this. I didn't sign up for this. I was, I was very nervous. Not that God couldn't use that. But part of it was, it just didn't seem to ring true to me. Like, I'm not saying God doesn't... Obviously, God uses street preachers and people can be converted from that. But for me, I just felt, it just felt intrusive. And, and like, they're not there to hear a sermon and I'm kind of just barging into their space... It just did not feel very authentic, but, but I did it because I had to. It, was, it felt very forced, though. And maybe you've gotten messages or emails from people that you didn't sign up for. Like, you know, the ones about your car warranty. You get those voicemails. It's like, I don't even have a car warranty. Why are you calling me? You know, or you get the junk mail and you're like, how do these people get my email address? I didn't, I didn't contact these people. Why, why are they trying to sell me something? I didn't opt in for this. Well, I have some good news for you this morning. Because the kingdom of God, unlike the unwanted spam or robocalls we sometimes get, the kingdom of God is not something forced upon us. A lot of times we we live like it's something we have to do. You know, I've got to do this for Jesus, or we feel obligated, and I'm not saying we don't have responsibilities. But the beauty of the kingdom is that God gives us a chance to opt in. We can say yes. Yeah, I want to be a part of that. Or we can say no. The choice is ours. And in our passage today, Paul shares his story of his mission to win others to Christ. In short, Paul opted in. He said, I'm in. I'm going to give up my rights for the sake of the gospel. And that was, yes, a voluntary choice on his part. But he's an example to us of what it means to live not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of others. You see, the Christian life is about opting in, about choosing to be a part of furthering God's kingdom. So today we're going to look at a few things. First, in our passage, we're going to look at the, ba- we're going to look at the backstory to it as to why, for example, Paul chose not to receive a wage for preaching. Next, we're going to see how Paul adapts himself to all these different groups in order to further the gospel. And then finally, we're going to think about, consider together, how we might make our own lives more strategic for the gospel. So first of all, it's helpful to know some of what may be going on in the background. Why is Paul boasting that his reward for preaching is doing it for free? I mean, I'm sorry, I don't think I would be boasting about that. Like, how is that a reward to do it for free? I mean, I love you guys, I really do, but I kind of need to eat and pay my bills, and so I don't think I could do this for free. Um, But Paul's boast was that he offered people the gospel free of charge. 
Now, in his day, there were many traveling preachers and sages, and they got a bad rap, probably in some cases for good reason. A lot of people saw traveling teachers and wise people as only looking for money. Okay, and so unfortunately, people would tend to lump Paul in that group too. Now, Paul did not want to have this hindrance to the gospel. He didn't want anything to get in the way of people receiving Christ. He didn't, even though he had a right to charge a wage, like he could have earned money for his preaching, that wouldn't have been wrong. But this may be one reason why he chose to preach for free is because of the bad reputation a lot of traveling teachers had and perpetuated. Paul wanted no hindrance to the gospel. Also, there were undoubtedly wealthy people in the church at Corinth that would have paid for his ministry. They would have gladly funded him, but Paul maintained his independence. He didn't want to become obligated to anybody because if he accepted their money in their day and time, he would have been considered their client. So um, you would have a wealthy benefactor that was the patron, and the person who was dependent on their funds was considered the client. And there were expectations in that relationship. You know, then as now, money came with strings attached. If you're, if you're paying for something, you have a lot of power to call the shots. And Paul did not want to be obligated to anyone. Paul wanted to be free, free to preach the truth not what someone tries to tell him to preach. And then he wanted to be free to preach to whom? To everybody, as we saw, not just the elite. So Paul had the right to receive a wage for his preaching, but he willingly gave it up for the sake of the gospel. He opted in. He said, there was no law. God didn't say, Paul, you must not charge a wage. No, he just opted in and said, I'm going to do this. I think this is going to help me preach Jesus to as many people as possible. So, yes, you know, Peter and some of the other disciples, apostles, they, they receive a living. They are, they're married, all of this other stuff. I'm going to choose to remain single. I'm going to remain free from financial entanglement, too. And moving to my next point, we see Paul appealing to a wide variety of people in order to further the gospel. He mentions his freedom in verse 19. And then he says, I will, I've made myself a slave to everyone. So he adapted himself to people so he could communicate the gospel to them in a way they would understand. And he mentions four categories of people. He mentions the Jews. He mentions those under the law, those not under the law, the weak. So those are only four examples. But that that gives us like a broad spectrum that Paul talked to all kinds of people. He built relationships with all kinds of people, all for the sake of the gospel. And we might read this and think, though, I mean, because it's so repetitive in verses 19 to 23, he's saying, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. And I won't repeat all of it. We think, was he just like a chameleon? Was Paul just trying to fit in? I mean, was he just catering to people's whims and just being wishy-washy? The elite... And, and wealthy people in that day often looked down on teachers like Paul. They saw them as fickle. Oh, you're just catering to the masses. You're weak. You're fickle. And they even referred to them, um, this is, their word was a slave, like you're a slave to the masses. So that might shed some light here on why Paul's referring to himself as a slave. It's almost as if he's owning it. And he's saying, you call me a slave? Yeah, I'm a slave to as many people as possible if it'll serve the purpose of the gospel, is what he's saying. He opted in to win people to Christ. And if that was the way he could do it, he said, okay, yeah, you can call me a slave. You can call me whatever you want, but I'm going to opt in and do that. You see, Paul was not just trying to appease people or get them to like him. Paul had a higher purpose. He was putting putting himself on their level so they could relate to him. But he wasn't just trying to get them to like him or keep them happy. I mean, if Paul were trying to keep people happy, he probably would have received the money from the wealthy people and tried to keep them happy. You know, he probably wouldn't have preached to everybody, everybody. He would have catered to certain people. But Paul's not about that. He's trying to further the gospel and spread it to as many people as possible. That's his mission. He says that he'd become all things to all people. 
He says, I become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And I counted, the word all is used three times in verse 22. That's a lot of all, just verse 22. He's driving home the point. He said, I become all things to all people. So by all possible means, I might save some. Paul was opting in with everything he had so he could save as many people as possible. Now we're going to switch the focus real quick from Paul to ourselves. We know Paul was all in. He, he opted in. He signed up for the email. He signed up for the robocalls, you could say. He, he signed up to be all in for Jesus. But we're going to switch the focus from Paul to ourselves. Now in light of Paul's strategic efforts, I wonder if we could think creatively about ways we could be more strategic. You know, Paul lived in a specific culture and time, you know, where for him... It was best for him not to receive a wage for his preaching. He actually, I don't know if I mentioned this already, he did work for a living. The man had to eat. He worked as a tent maker. It mentions that in the book of Acts. So he worked with his hands. He provided for his needs of his, of his own ability. He didn't depend on anybody. You know, that was best for Paul in his time. We live in a different time and culture. The gospel does not change. We have the same good news about Jesus, but we live in a very different time, right? A lot has changed in our world. For example, we have access to so much technology, and it can be a blessing and a hindrance, right? Um, you know, Paul had to physically travel from place to place and preach, right? He had to get on the horse or the camel and go, and he would preach, and he would travel to the churches. I mean, you and I, I mean, I could preach and, and Benjamin does a video and theoretically anyone in the world could watch it, right? You and I can watch preachers or, or speaker, Christian speakers on TV. We can watch it around the world. The gospel can go around the world in, in a matter of seconds. And that can be a blessing. I mean, we have so many ways we can opt in for Jesus, you know, and, and reach people nowadays. I mean, we can do that as a way of ministering to people and a way of being ministered to. So how can we be more strategic in reaching others with the gospel? I think it starts at just examining our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. I don't think there's a law here saying you have to be like Paul and you have to appeal to everybody. You have to not take a wage. Or I don't think this is written in stone in that way, but I think Paul is an example for us of someone who was creative in his time and he ministered to people with what he had in his time. But you have abilities, I have abilities, we have gifts that we have to offer too. No, we may not be the Apostle Paul. We don't have to be the Apostle Paul. We're who God created us to be. You know, and we have gifts. Now, it could be spiritual gifts. Those are important. But I'm talking too about abilities and talents. Some of you have these wonderful talents and gifts and graces that, you know, bring you into contact with people that none of the rest of us ever meet. Each of us has a circle of influence in that way. I'll give you an example. Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying I am an expert at pickleball, but I love to play pickleball. I got into it while I was in seminary and played intramural um, but I've met people I never would have met if I did not play pickleball. We play out at the Honey Bowen Courts um, regularly, most weekends. And it's so much fun because I meet people from other churches, people with no church, uh, people who are retired, people who are like 14, people who, I mean, just all, all ages and background college, a lot of college students, you know, come out there. And it's a lot of fun. And it's really fun to, you know, begin building relationships with people and just get to know them, you know. It doesn't matter if the person you're playing with is Catholic, you know, or doesn't have a church. You're just having a good time together. And so for me, I see my opting in as just saying yes to building relationships with people. Um, I haven't felt called to preach to anybody or, you know, anything like that yet. But if the Lord leads me, you know, I pray to be bold to share my faith as he leads. 
Um, going back to my story from the beginning where we had to walk up to people cold and start telling them about Jesus when they're trying to get in the nightclub, going back to that, you know, that just did not seem very effective to me. But later on in my college career, I had the chance to attend a missions conference. And while I was at the missions conference, they had a class on evangelism. And so I took it. And for the first time ever, I heard the term relation, relational evangelism, like evangelizing others by building personal relationships. And that really resonated with me. As I, I felt like, it felt like a breath of just <sighs> fresh air. I was like, I can get on board with that. And I'm not saying that there aren't people that, that preach to people they don't know and they get saved. But for me, I, I, you know, I just, it did not click with me to do that. But I, I thought I could get on board with building relationships with people. And it really resonated. You know, people come to church sometimes completely on their own. But often it's because they know somebody or they already have a relationship with someone who's here. Someone invited them. People like you. So that's where you come in. Each of you has a sphere of influence, you know, that I don't have, that your friends or neighbors don't have. Maybe it's through your job or a hobby, extracurricular activity. You know, you guys encounter people in your daily lives that would never walk through the doors of a church. People I'd never have the privilege of getting to meet, most likely. But you have that opportunity. So what can we do with that? How might you opt in and share Jesus with someone you encounter. And it may not look like telling them about Jesus right off the bat. Maybe just getting to know them. Building some trust. You know, one of my favorite things, um, when I worked in the corporate world, I knew that I wasn't going to be there forever. I knew I was destined for ministry, which the corporate world is ministry too. I will say that. But I knew that I was not going to be there forever. But I loved getting to know people that didn't go to church. And a lot of them had grown up in church, not all, but some, you know, and they just, for whatever reason, weren't, you know, going at the moment or something had happened in their life. And I'll tell you, a lot of people will not say no to you praying for them. That is a, a non-threatening way to share love with people. You know, somebody's, you know, grandma's in the hospital, just to use an example. If somebody is struggling, I don't think I've ever met anybody. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone that would say no if you just offered to pray for them. That's a simple way we could reach out with God's love. So I, I just want to encourage you with that. There, like I said, there's no hard and fast rule here. But we do want to share the love of God, and we can be creative with it. So let me wrap this up for all of us. You know, Paul's example shows us here that the gospel calls us to something bigger than ourselves. We're part of a larger story. You know, it involves people from all walks of life and backgrounds. You and I are part of a larger family, the family of God. So just consider this week, how can you opt in and share Christ with somebody? Okay? Thanks be to God.